Um, and due to the scale of the Tamarisk invasion along the corridor, it was part of the park that we just uh, decided we didn't have the resources to try and tackle. Well, we weren't isolated in that, and there were lots of areas in the western U.S. where Tamarisk was a significant issue. And so uh, a lot of research was done, and it was decided to introduce the Tamarisk leaf beetle as a biocontrol agent. The Tamarisk leaf beetle is native um, to Eurasia, where the Tamarisk uh, plant is originally found, and uh, defoliates Tamarisk. So uh, those Tamarisk beetles were introduced in the upper basin, and by 2006, uh, they had be, been introduced into uh, a number of western states. They were never directly introduced into Arizona or Grand Canyon National Park. And based on uh, research that was done in the lab, uh, those researchers believe that the beetle would never make it further than the 38th parallel due to its diapause requirements. Well, they weren't quite right uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that laboratory experiments are never uh, exact proxies of the real world and insects evolve rapidly because they have a lot of, uh, um, they reproduce rapidly and have a lot of generations. And so they have made it into the park and you can see here, uh, this is a map uh, generated by Levi Jameson, who's a graduate student at University of Arizona, who's been mapping the spread of tamarisk leaf beetles in the canyon. And you can see uh, from Lee's Ferry, actually upstream of Lee's Ferry, downstream of Glen Canyon Dam, all the way uh, down past River Mile uh, 200 or so, we have uh, tamarisk beetles. Uh, they're not um, in continuous uh, distribution, so there are some significant areas uh, where you don't have them. But uh, we have seen, um, they first showed up in 2009, and we've seen them defoliating tamarisk. And what happens is the tamarisk will defoliate the uh, tamarisk uh, trees but it takes multiple defoliations before those trees may uh, succumb. And not all trees do succumb. There's differences in uh, genotypes uh, between those species, or uh, between those trees, and then you'll also find differences in microsite conditions. So those tamarisks that are closer to the river have better access to the water table, are be better able to resist the stresses of those repeated defoliations. But if what's happened in the upper basin is any indication of what might happen in the park, we can expect some significant mortality. Now this may seem like great, um, you know, the beetles are doing the work for us instead of us having to spend thousands of hours trying to remove these tamarisks. But what we don't know uh, is what the cascade of effects will be from the tamarisk leaf beetle. So we're going to have some fairly rapid changes in the riparian community. And since tamarisk have dominated these areas for decades, uh, wildlife species and recreationists have come to rely on tamarisk for the structure they provide, and uh, in the case of recreationists, for the shade they provide as well. So um, we decided to embark on a pilot project at Granite Camp in Monument Creek. And uh, this is a challenging project, given all the issues I've identified. We were successful uh, in partnering with Grand Canyon Association and securing funding through the Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust and also through uh, Park Service concession franchise fees. And the project entails uh, three main components. One is to test methods for riparian re rehabilitation at Granite Camp. Uh, the second is to recover data from a threatened archaeological site. And we actually have a crew down there as we speak um, doing that work. And the third is to mitigate visitor impacts and enrich the overall visitor experience. Here's a map of the area for those who aren't familiar. Uh, Granite Camp is at River Mile about 94, and, uh, which is downstream of Phantom Ranch. Uh, just upstream in Monument Creek is Monument Creek Camp. So you can either access this uh, via the river or you can hike down from Hermit um, to get down here, and that's along about a 10 mile hike in. Uh, Granite Camp, um, this is a close-up of the camp here, and it's a relatively small camp. It's only about an acre in size. Uh, this is um, upstream, and then this is moving downstream into Granite Rapids. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, the boats are usually um, docked there. We're going to be focusing our efforts uh, most likely in what we refer to as the new high water zone. So that's that's below the 97,000 foot level. So basically, uh, 
water flows don't get, actually these days don't get above 45,000 feet. And the reason why we chose Granite Camp is uh, for a number of reasons. One is due to, due to the accessibility. So we felt for a pilot project, it made the most sense to uh, pick a site that we could hike into um, that dramatically reduces your cost for implementing the project. Um, this is also a heavily used site by both backpackers and river runners. And that is kind of a double-edged sword. It provides an opportunity to engage with those user groups. And I think for a pilot project, it's really important to have these kind of discussions and to talk about you know, what restoration or rehabilitation means and to find out what their desired conditions are for these types of sites. Um, so the project scope, uh, we were down at the site with the interdisciplinary team uh, last September and talked about a lot of these issues. Um, we talked about what restoration means within the context of a highly altered river system. And uh, we decided that the term restoration was actually probably not a great term for what we were trying to do. And that rehabilitation or stewardship was a, a better term. Uh, the current condition for this site, as with many sites along the corridor, is that it's highly vegetated and uh, dominated by tamaris. And the vegetation is getting so thick at some of these sites is that some of these sites are actually no longer really usable for um, campsites, particularly for larger river groups. Our desired condition for this site is somewhat obscured by this misplaced graphic, but we are interested in um, trying to shift the balance at the site from non-native tamaris to native species, um, creating a more suitable wildlife habitat while still maintaining it as a high quality river camp. Our general approach is gonna be what I refer to as phased and pragmatic uh, rehabilitation or stewardship. One of the issues we need to consider uh, and what some folks have done at other sites outside of the park is doing wholesale removal of the tamaris. And in sites where you can get bulldozers to, that might be a feasible option. Um, here it's not really an option. Uh, the other issue here is because uh, this is a river camp. If we were to remove all the tamaris and we were to have some higher flow events, it's possible that um, the site could be eroded to the point that it would no longer be usable. So uh, it makes the most sense to uh, start doing work in relatively small areas, and then if those are uh, deemed to be successful, we'll, we'll expand that work to larger areas at this site and at other sites. So um, we're gonna try a, a range of different treatment options, and we're gonna do it in kind of a quasi-experimental framework. Uh, the reason why I say that is that it's a relatively small site, and so there's not a lot of room to work in. It's also a site, like I said, that is heavily used by users. We still want to maintain um, accessibility to the site, and we don't want it to make it look like a research plot. So it's gonna be a challenge from kind of a landscape architecture point of view to try to uh, learn from doing, but also trying to maintain the functionality of the site. So uh, the first uh, treatment we're gonna try is tamarisk girdling. So like I mentioned with the tamarisk leaf beetle, after repeated defoliations, it can result in mortality of those tamarisks. Now when those tamarisks are dead, they will stand there uh, dead, taking up space. And well, because it's a desert environment, they will likely remain there for decades, if not centuries. Um, the other treatment will be actually removing the tamarisk. So that'll be either cutting them at the base and applying herbicide to prevent them from resprouting, or uh, a method that has been tried successfully up a dinosaur is actually using a mechanical winch uh, to winch the trees out of the ground. Uh, the advantage of that method is that um, you don't have stumps exposed and you also don't need to use herbicide. Uh, the disadvantage is that it's a lot of work to do that. Um, so in both of those treatments, in some of those areas, we will um, just either girl them or remove the tamarisk skin, do nothing, and see how the native vegetation responds or non-native vegetation responds. And in some of those areas, we'll actively plant native species. Um, so we'll do a combination of both passive revegetation and active revegetation. Um, obviously, to access any of these sites, because it is a kind of overgrown site, we'll have to do some minor pruning and clearing just to implement those treatments. Um, for those of you who are familiar with some of the species um, in the canyon, um, right, typical riparian species, here's a list of some of the species we are considering for revegetation re work. Those highlighted in green are your uh, trees, um, those in blue are your uh, shrubs, and then we've got some um, forbs and grasses here as well. Um, 
Now, just to give you some context, uh, like I mentioned, there's cameras removal in the side canyons for um, you know over a decade. And uh, this is a picture of Monument Creek, which is uh, within the, the study area. We have done uh, repeated tamarisk uh, removals um, in this site uh, four times since uh, 2004. And you can see in this pre-treatment photo, we have numerous tamarisk. These are the kind of darker green um, plants with the kind of feathery looking needles. So you've got a lot of young tamarisk uh, along the drainage as well as some mature tamarisk back in the background. Now you can see in 2012, and this was after a recent um, retreatment um, just this past year, um, it has been pretty successful. Um, you'll see that there's actually been a pretty good expansion of native species uh, within the site, including uh, backris, jimmy weed, scratch grass, and a number of other species. The reason why I'm showing this slide is to show that you can get good response from native species um, just by simply removing tamarisk and staying on top of them. But it can take time, and we found that at some sites, even a few years after treatment, there wasn't really a good uh, response from the native vegetation. So that's why at Granite Camp, we're going to um, try both approaches. We're going to try the passive approach, where you just remove the tamarisk and see what happens, and you also do the active approach, where you are actually planting other native species at the site. Here's a, a workflow for where we're at in the project. So we've completed all the compliance, uh, which is highlighted in green. Uh, those in the orange boxes are kind of in progress. So we're in the process of doing outreach and consultation um, with stakeholders and tribes. Uh, we're also in the process of assessing the site. So we just completed a species list for the site. In a couple weeks, we'll be installing some monitoring wells. Uh, the reason why we're doing that is to determine depth to groundwater table and also identify the relationship between uh, river flows and the groundwater table. The reason why that's important for the riparian species is we know for a number of species that we plan on planting there, such as uh, cottonwoods and Gooding's willow, um, using pole plantings, in order for those to be successful, you have to get them down to the water table. And uh, by putting the wells in, we can get a, a sense of those uh, relationships between <coughs> the river and the groundwater table. And uh, the ideal is to plant those at the deepest um, level that you would expect the water table to drop. We we'll also are in the process of collecting uh, native um, seeds and plants from the local area, which we'll be propagating and using to plant on site. And uh, once we start to initiate the, the main work of removing the tamarisk, um, which will probably be done this winter, we'll be informing user groups well ahead of time so that they're aware there will be work crews in the area. We'll also be doing pre-treatment surveys, um, like we do with um, all uh, similar projects that we do, to determine uh, the condition of the site before we initiate any work. And then we'll be doing post-treatment monitoring as well as to assess the effectiveness of that work. So um, this project presents a lot of uh, challenges. Um, one is really articulating what the rehabilitation objectives are. Like I mentioned, if you think of uh, those, those uh, pictures of the pre-dam and post-dam conditions, um, the way I see it is, uh, you know, successful rehabilitation will lie somewhere in the middle. Uh, one option is to do nothing, but as a National Park Service, we are mandated to uh, preserve and restore, uh, when feasible, resources within the park. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is having a site devoid of vegetation. The only way to accomplish that while the dam is still in place would be to remove all the vegetation and to come back to the site on a yearly basis using herbicides and manual power to keep it cleared, which doesn't seem sensible as well. So we're in that middle fuzzy zone of needing to do something, but not necessarily sure exactly what that something is. And that's why it's important to get, I think, input from different user groups, uh, different experts to try and determine what a reasonable desired condition is, um, given those constraints. Also, about 95% of the park is potential wilderness. And the Park Service is mandated to treat even potential wilderness as if it is designated wilderness. So accordingly, instead of um, at this site and other sites going in with chainsaws and heavy equipment, we have to do it the hard way and try our best to use uh, hand saws and non-motorized equipment to accomplish the work. Obviously, it's a lot more work to do that. It can cost more money in the end. 
but it helps to preserve the wilderness character of the park. Uh, because the use it has a high, uh, the site has a high level of use, uh, 